Prime Time Local News, serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. The Battlefords Agency Tribal Chiefs have started this to search to locate and honor missing students who attended two Saskatchewan residential schools and the federal government is coming to the table as well, pledging over $2.7 million to support the community-led research. It's been a sad, sad uh, victory for us. It was an emotional day for representatives from the Battleford Agency Tribal Chiefs who gathered to give an update on their search efforts at the sites of two former residential schools, the Del Moss Residential School and the Battleford Industrial School. My little brother Reggie never came back home. He, he died of starvation at the residential school. Today, I still miss him. According to records, there were 107 recorded deaths at the Battlefords Industrial School, while the Del Mas School had 44 recorded deaths, though officials suspect those numbers are undercounts. Well, we think it's inaccurate. And we think that the 107 in the Battleford Industrial School is inaccurate. In July, SNC Lavalin began the search at no charge. So far, one set of remains have been found, but the search is expanding and will begin again in the spring. First Nations in the area are using school records to help with their search. 107 recorded deaths at Battleford Industrial School. Uh, 70 plus were moved in the 70s to a location. We know the location. We just are, are researching the, the names of, the, of those students. The federal government announced almost $2.8 million of funding over three years, that will go towards the efforts and help honor the memory of those lost, including a permanent interpretive center. This is a responsibility that we have to support communities as you grieve and heal, and a responsibility to remember and memorialize all of the lost children. It is a responsibility uh, to ensure that the horrific truth of residential schools, residential institutions is never forgotten. The National Residential School Crisis Line is available 24-7 to provide emotional and crisis referral services for those who need it at 1-866-925-4419. And today is Kindness Wednesday across the border city and local groups are getting in the spirit with kindness and pink themed activities. Jasmine King has the details. Pink Shirt Day is known across the country as a day to promote anti-bullying. Here in Lloydminster that has transformed to Kindness Wednesday. A few local businesses are having sales which go towards Beyond Borders such as shirts at the Lloydminster and District Co-op designed by local artist Brandy Hofer and more. And Denny's restaurant contacted me recently and they want to hop on board. So today they're selling their Grand Slam special for $2.99. Um, and then Spiro's restaurant has been um, selling delicious heart-shaped pizzas all throughout the month of February. And then Timber Cafe, located in Home Hardware, has a pink theme menu all week long. The money raised from these sales will go to Beyond Borders Circle of Change, which will be used to fund local programs and projects. Our Kindness Wins Grants, um, and every school in Lloydminster is eligible to apply for one of those grants. And then we also provide uh, pr financial support to our KIPP teams in both of our high schools, and they stand for Kindness is Power. We're super excited to be able to offer two two-day trauma counseling strategies for healing and resilience courses during Mental Health Awareness Week in May. For those who are looking to support without spending money, Plamondon encourages residents to do random acts of kindness. She also touches on how Beyond Borders has seen the event grow over the years. I really think our community is, is, is latched on to this, that we realize that we all have the capacity for kindness and we all believe that it's important. So I think it's grown quite a bit actually over the years. And I think it's it's such an uplifting movement to become a part of because it's the thread that connects us all to one another. Another way to support is to wear pink in the rink tonight at the Bobcats game to get free admission. Jasmine King, Primetime Local News.
Well, tax season is upon us, and with that comes the yearly task of filing paperwork. Our Nicole Gruber sat down with LACPA to get some tips on filing taxes. Today for Primetime Local News, I'm joined with Ellen A, CPA, formerly known as Lucky & Associates, to talk about filing taxes as it is tax season. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us here today. No problem. Glad to help. So first, because it is tax season, what are some important things that you think people should be aware of when it comes to filing taxes? Well, um, well like uh, this time of the year, you'll, you often get a lot of stuff in the mail, stuff from your employer, like a T4. Uh, sometimes you may, like if you're, if you're a member, say at the Lloydminster Co-op, for example, you might get a T4A, which is like, you, know, you get a little bit of uh, income from that. Uh, you know, and then if you have investments, then you might get some tax slips from, from your bank. So there's, and then, uh, if you do, you know, if you spend money on RSPs, you might get some RSP slips along the way. So yeah, check your mail fairly frequently in the, in the month of February and early March. Uh, there'll be probably a fair bit, of, you know, there could be, uh, a, a, quite a number of tax documents, depending on what you, what you're, what you're all involved in. So. And what are some tips and tricks that you have for people wanting to do it on their own? Well, uh, there's there's a couple of options. Uh, there's there's some there's some pretty good tax software out there. Uh, you could go to Walmart. You could go to Staples. Um, they they have some pretty decent talk tax software. I've I've I've, I've uh, used it before for um, just helping out a couple of friends here and there, and uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. Like especially if you you, you know if you're you know a person who is employed and you know maybe don't don't have a business or anything like that you know it's probably the ideal thing to do and it's doesn't doesn't cost all that much i think you pay like 40 or 50 bucks and and that gets it gets it done for you and it could be pretty efficient um if you have some more stuff going on maybe you have a rental property maybe you have some complex investments or something like that or own a business might be better to go to see an accounting firm or or a tax preparation office. So if somebody had more than one way of income this past year, would you recommend they go to a trained professional or is it something that they can do on their own? Could still be done on your own. Like if you were, you know, if you were on CRB uh, or on EI, for example, or, and uh, maybe you were laid off for a while or, and then you came back to work, like those stuff, uh, like they're mostly uh, just from tax slips. And a lot of that stuff really, you could do most of that, uh, using a tax software. Um, it's more so if you got like employment expense, like things that have a little bit more judgment, like employment expenses, business, business statements, um, rental properties, that's probably where you want to seek a professional for sure. And when would you recommend for people to aim to get this done? Well, you have your deadline is uh, April 30th for for the majority of people. Uh, that's the deadline. Uh, there's some exceptions, like if you if you um, are self-employed, have rental property, your your deadline might be June fifteenth, so you, that could be extended. But in in, uh, in all cases, though, any tax that is due, personal tax that is due, is due April thirtieth. So um, that's that's ideal for most for most people to have it filed before then, um, which it gives you enough time because usually the last bit of tax slips will come in. Uh, usually middle of March, there's the occasional time where you might have some investment income that might uh, go on a what they call a T3 slip and T3s are due uh, March 31st for like that, that get issued to individuals. So uh, some people might not have all their tax slips until beginning of April even in some cases. So. And when it comes to going to a firm and, and having a professional help out with taxes, how much does it usually cost to get that done? It varies depending on who you go to. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know off the top of my head as to what the, the lowest quoted returns are. I feel like it's probably around 80 bucks, maybe 90 bucks. Uh, and then if you go to a, a chartered professional accounting firm, uh, I think they range, you'll probably see a range of anywhere between 150 bucks to probably I don't know, 220, 230 bucks. Like there'll be a little bit of a range there, depending on who you go to. Uh, but yeah, uh, and and that, those when when I say those rates, those are usually for you know individuals who are employed, so like uh, employed by by an employer, and then just have have basic basic uh, 
I would call that as a basic tax return. Is there any other important information that you would like to pass along? Well, there's um, the one thing that that's still available to taxpayers is if you you can still buy RSPs until the end of Fe until February 28th, and uh, if you buy RSPs, that can go against you know that could help reduce your uh, taxable income for 2021 here. So so that's an opportunity still. Um, and uh, another thing, some people often don't think of is uh, you know during the year, like during the year, if you're making a fair bit of money and you want to donate something to charity, you know, uh, that's a, that's an option. You can get a charitable donation receipt for that. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us here today. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. Well, on this Kindness Wednesday, it's time to check in with the beautiful Shelby Clark for the first look at your weather forecast. Thank you so much to the handsome Jason Mackey. And now taking a first look at your weather forecast. Yes, today here in the Border City, it is Kindness Wednesday. So hopefully everybody is being kind out there and spreading it across the community. But today we are seeing a cooler day, unfortunately, at minus 18. With that wind chill, it does feel like closer to minus 30. So hopefully everybody is still trying to stay warm out there as you are spreading some kindness. Now switching over to temperatures across the region for Alberta and Saskatchewan. On the Alberta side, we're seeing a lot of minus 16, minus 17 degrees on the map, minus 18 in Mar Wayne, while up in Lacklebiche, they're sitting at minus 15, as well as down in Vagreville, and Edmonton is seeing minus 13 degrees. Now switching over to our Saskatchewan side here, um, they are seeing some slightly cooler temperatures compared to the Alberta side, but not too bad. Most spots are seeing around minus 18, minus 19 degrees on the Saskatchewan side. Minus 15 up in Isle of Cross, while St. Walberg is at minus 19, as well as down in North Battleford, and Maidstone is at minus 20, while down in Macklin, they are seeing minus 18 as well there. And for North Battleford, they will be going down to a low of minus 25, so we do not have a uh, total extreme cold warning in effect at the moment. There is some spots on the Saskatchewan side, though I will show later on in my next weather segment about which spots do you have that extreme cold warning still in effect but for North Battleford they'll be seeing going down to low minus 25 with a little more, more cloudier skies and tomorrow they'll be seeing minus 17 throughout the day with a little bit more sun and now switching over to Cold Lake they'll be going down to low minus 25 as well and tomorrow they will be warming up slightly to minus 12 and they will be seeing a little bit more sun peaking behind those clouds and for here in the border city, we'll be going down to low of minus 20. So we will be uh, cooling down slightly, but not too bad. And tomorrow we will be seeing a slightly warmer day there at minus 11 throughout the day. And we will be seeing a mix of some sun and cloud. And now switching over to our three day forecast for here in the border city. We will be seeing a warmer day, as I was saying, for Thursday with a mix of some sun and cloud. Friday will be starting off this weekend at minus 6. So seeing those single digit temps will be good to see for the weekend. And then on Saturday, we will be seeing minus 5 throughout the day on Saturday for our weekend. And for Kindness Winds, please remember to post a photo of your crew in Kindness Winds gear. And you can take Lloyd Co-op on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and we'll share it to our audience. That's all I got for our first look at your weather forecast. Jace will have more news coming up after the break. The Lloydminster Bobcats are continuing their successful season. After being named Player of the Month in January, the team's leading scorer is continuing to shine. Evan Kenny has more on the Bobcats star. In 19 games to start 2022, Ethan O'Coin has 25 points to show. Based on his play, O'Coin is the newest commit to the NCAA. Well, obviously it's something that I've dreamed of since I was 12 years old to be able to play in front of college and get the scholarship there, so it's been, it's been pretty crazy. As a teenager, the Calgary, Alberta native had the same tough choice many kids face today, WHL or U.S. college hockey. Now, looking back at his choice from years ago. Yeah, yeah, it feels awesome. It feels really good. A coin has committed to the St. Cloud State Huskies. Last season, St. Cloud lost in the NCAA Frozen Four Championship. This season, the Huskies are ranked 11th in the U.S. with a record of 15, 11, and 3. Uh, their coaching staff made a really good job of being able to connect with me over virtually as I can go down on a visit. So with, that, with them being able to do that and with their facilities and coaching staff and their record, then... It was a pretty easy choice from there. 
number 11, uh, number 11's uh, 200 foot game and, and how he can back check now and how hard he works defensively. Um, and I think that's something, you know, that we really worked with Ethan on was being more of a complete 200 foot player and, and being able to play all three zones. And, um, you know, he's, he's accepted that challenge. I think he's looked forward to that challenge. On the season, number 11 has 32 goals and 59 points in 57 games. A coin is the second Bobcat to commit to post-secondary following Zafir Rauji with Mount Royal of the U Sport League back in December. Evan Kenny, Primetime Local Sports. And now it's time to head over to Shelby Clark with another look at your weather forecast. Thanks so much, Jason. Now taking a first look at your weather forecast. Here in the Border City, we're taking another look, sorry. We'll be starting off with the central region of Alberta and Saskatchewan here. Um, at the basket is at minus 15, while Edmonton is at minus 13 degrees. Thanks, Jace. He was just helping me out with something real quick. <laughs> minus 8, minus 7 in Edson and White Court, while Jasper is just seeing that minus 10 mark. Uh, Red Deer is at minus 16, while Rocky Mountain House is at minus 12. So we are still seeing some cooler temperatures on the Alberta side, but we are warming up just a little bit as we move more on throughout the week. Switching now over to the Saskatchewan side, they're seeing some slightly cooler temperatures compared to the Alberta side with minus 18 in Saskatoon, like here in the border city, minus 16 up in Cold Lake, while Meadow Lake is at minus 17 degrees and is minus 19 in North Balford, while Prince Albert and Melford both twinning at minus 22. Now switching over to our northern region now of the provinces, they definitely have cooled down slightly as well, but they aren't seeing too bad of temperatures compared to what they have been seeing uh, last week and earlier on this week. Minus 14 in Buffalo Nares and Lalash, while South End is at minus Minus 15, minus 17 in Wollaston Lake in Uranium City, while Flimplon is just hitting minus 18 degrees, and it is minus 21, 22 in Stony Rapids and down in LaRange. Now switching over to Alberta side to check them out. Uh, Grand Prairie and Peace River seem to be seeing some warmer temperatures at minus 6, minus 7 degrees. It is minus 9 up in high level, while Slave Lake is just hitting minus 15. Fort McMurray is at minus 10, and Fort Chipon is at minus 12. Now going over to our southern region now to check them out. They are cooled down quite a bit to so seeing those uh, double digit temperatures as well. Uh, minus 11 in Banff, while it's minus 13, 14 in Calgary and Lethbridge. Medicine Head is at minus 16 and Coronation is seeing minus 18 degrees. And now going over to seeing our Saskatchewan side, they're kind of slightly uh, cooled down a bit too, going past that uh, minus 20 point. Uh, Esteban and Regina both at minus 20. And over on this side as well, they do have the, that extreme cold warning still in effect for today. So it's mostly in the Saskatchewan side. Uh, minus 21 in Yorkton as well as in Swift Current and Kindersley and Musha is just at minus 18. And now looking at temperatures back across the region, what we're going to see for our evening lows, we will be seeing some better evening lows than what we've been seeing earlier on in the week, that is for sure. Uh, Myrna will be seeing a low of minus 15, while Provost will be seeing a low of minus 16 degrees. Wayne will be seeing a low of minus 18, while the rest will be past that minus 20 point that they will be seeing. Paradise Hill and Isle Cross will be seeing a low of minus 23, while Bonneville and Meadow Lake will be seeing a low of minus 24, and Unity and Pearson will be seeing a low of minus 25. So we will be seeing some better evening lows and throughout the night across the region. And now looking at our seven day forecast for here in the border city, we'll be seeing a mixture of some sun and cloud tomorrow at minus 11. Friday and Saturday, we'll see minus six and minus five for the weekend with a little bit more cloud coverage. And we'll be ending off with minus eight throughout the day on Sunday. The next week, we'll see a little bit more snowfall that next Tuesday, around a 60% chance of some flurries once again uh, at minus four. And that will continue into next Wednesday as well. That's another look at your weather forecast. We'll have more news coming up after the break.
We are back again this week with Stephanie Dobson. Stephanie is a local lawyer and mediator with Hanka Divorce Law and Mediation here in Lloydminster. Back for another segment of Healthy Thriving Family After Divorce. Stephanie, this time we're going to be talking about something that can be really contentious with couples who are going through separation and divorce. And uh, basically, it's developing a parenting plan for what we would call yeah. maybe a high conflict situation uh, between the parents. So let's talk about how the, in a situation like this is the best way to start to figure out a plan that's going to work for the kids. Well, of course, all separated parents somehow will need to figure out a way to parent their children. The ultimate question is always how close or distant will that parenting be? So the level of detail in a parenting plan, I say, usually runs along a continuum. So as a divorce professional, I can help to adjust that parenting plan um, based on their level of conflict. So where conflict is high, I look to help parents to create more distance between them. So in the divorce world, we call that a parallel parenting plan. So think of it like two parallel lines, one parent parents over here with their own set of rules and kid management, and then one parent parents over here and does their own thing. And there's not much crossover as far as things like communication, problem solving, or even generally interacting about the children between the parents. So generally in these parenting plans, parents will act autonomously from one another in their households and the management of the children. So this type of parenting plan I consider as distinct from the opposite end of the spectrum, which is called a co-parenting plan, which is more cooperative in nature and where the parents generally communicate and problem solve with one another about things that impact or that are relating to the children. So in these kind of cases, we can use less detail on that continuum that I was talking about. So Stephanie, why would uh, parents decide to go with a parallel plan as opposed to the co-parenting plan? Well, quite simply, this type of parenting plan is really intended to help to de-escalate conflict between parents. Now, why would we want to do such a thing? Of course, it's nice to live without a lot of conflict in one's life, but primarily speaking, when we're talking about separation and divorce, our viewers might recall in previous episodes, we've talked about the negative impact of parental conflict on children's healthy uh, development and on their ability to thrive in a two parent, uh, in a two household uh, childhood. So when parents are unable to reduce their conflict on their own, then it's better to have them act autonomously in their own households and, and just parent separately. So our viewers might wonder what type of impact this has on the children, because we often talk in the divorce world about wanting to help parents to learn to communicate, learn to work with one another. But sometimes you just can't. And so if the, if the option, if there's two options on the table and one is interaction between parents with conflict or autonomy preventing conflict, I can tell you I'll always recommend more autonomy to prevent that conflict for parents. And what do parents need to consider, Stephanie, if they think that the uh, parallel parenting plan is right for them? Well, I've thought of three things here. One is communication, one is a detail of the parenting plan, and one is to avoid opportunities for conflict. So first talking about communication, this is one of the most difficult things for parallel parents to do effectively. So it's important really to make a very detailed plan for, for communication. First things first, get off that text messaging and please, as much as possible, stop verbally communicating. These are the two types of uh, methods of communication that tend to escalate conflict and also lead to misunderstandings. Email, or even better yet, a co-parenting app are my two recommendations here um, to help to um, create a little bit more distance and a little bit more organization and effectiveness about the communication. So the next, we talked a moment ago about this continuum of how detailed your parenting plan is. So I always say the higher the conflict, the more important it is to create a roadmap for parent expectations. So sometimes, uh, you know, you might need not only the detail of here, this is what we agree we're gonna do, but also, if that doesn't happen, here's how we're going to resolve that conflict. And lastly, is try to avoid uh, any opportunities for conflict as much as possible. So when you're exchanging the kids, you might wanna think about a neutral way to exchange the kids. Keep it so that you don't really interact. 
Maybe you will want to create a schedule for activities where you attend on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and the other parent attends on the other days of the week. Or you just generally can look internally at the types of situations that create conflict for you and your co-parent and to make a plan to generally avoid those things. All right, Stephanie. Well, thank you once again for joining us this week. And uh, we'll be back again next week to talk more. These issues are just so important, uh, you know, and there's so many different angles. I never realized until we started this series. So we appreciate your input and we will chat with you again next week. Yeah, there's never ending uh, issues to talk about. Thanks, Stacey. Furniture set and design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. Joining us today for Primetime Local News is Carla Furman with the Border City Rotary Club. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you for having me, Shelby. Of course. Now we're here to speak on the reboot for Irish Pub Night for 2022. And this is a huge deal, especially for Border City Rotary Club, with how long you've been waiting to do this in-person event once again. And hopefully this year it will work out. But how long has it been now since it's been in person? Well, technically for us gathering all together, three years, because two years ago we canceled. Last year we did a little bit of a hybrid type version where we did the drive through, which was a lot of fun, but it's still not the same. Like we, we all dressed up, there was lots of smiles and laughs, but at the end of the day, we were done in two hours and it was still daylight out and, uh, and not daylight of the next morning type thing. So we are so excited to finally be back. And with previous events, you know, when it was in person instead of the hybrid thing that you did last year, how was support from residents? Lloydminster is phenomenal. Like we are such a lucky organization to be established here in Lloydminster. The community always comes um, out in support and goes over and beyond. So it, uh, it makes it easy to do these things and to get excited about these things, just talking with other fellow community members and Rotarians, like there is excitement for this and to get back and, and to be able to do something and support people and be out there and just have some fun. And for people who may be unaware of what Irish Pub Night is all about, what exactly do the proceeds go towards? Can you kind of explain what this event is all about? <laughs> So first and foremost, it's all about fun and showing how fun and exciting Rotarians are. And then on top of that, we raise funds for within our community that we utilize. So a lot of times in the past, we have supported organizations like the Youth Center or the Sexual Assault Center, uh, Interval Home. Uh, there's been a few other ones along the way too. And a lot of times it has something to do with youth as well. It's been one of our mandates for a long time. And uh, just the ability to give back to the community is just such a blessing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, of course, before we were talking about how two years ago when this was first canceled, or, or almost three years ago now, that how hard it was that week to kind of figure out that you weren't able to do this event. So for this year, how was it for the Border City Rotary Club to set this up and kind of set it up to get back into in person? Uh, well, there was a lot of back and forth, to be honest. Um, for the longest time, we were just not going to do it. Uh, we were thinking maybe a hybrid style uh, drive through with maybe some live stream entertainment of some sort. Um, but then there was some whisperings happening, you know, that maybe some mandates were going to ease up a little bit. Things were looking a little bit promising. And uh, as a group, we got talking and like, if we go two years without having Irish pub night, there's a really good chance we will lose the momentum and the excitement and the knowledge of our event. So we decided to just push forward. And so in past years, usually we start the summer before putting this event on and it's literally been in the last couple of weeks. So a little bit chaotic, but exciting. Um, it's, it's amazing how fast it's come together. It is going to look a little bit different than past years. Um, this year, our biggest focus is really just bringing the community together, having a fun night, 
all the other stuff, all the extra funds and stuff that gets raised is a bonus, which we'll then put back into the community at, after the fact. Um, in the past, we've always selected a group or a project or something prior to, so everybody knows what it's going towards. And uh, this year, we're just really focusing on that community, bringing everybody together, having a fun night. And like I said, everything else is just a bonus so we can give back and continue our support with different organizations in Whitminster. And for all those residents out there that are excited to see that this is coming back this year, what can you tell them that they can expect for this year's event? Uh, well, it's definitely going to be one of our biggest events that we've put on. Um, we have a, a fairly well-known big name coming to perform we've got Derek Gregory which you know we haven't done something like that and in, in the years that I have been a part of Rotary um, it's it's been a smaller local typically uh, entertainment so we're bringing Derek Gregory in from Hannah Alberta and I don't know if you were down at the beer gardens this summer for the chuck wagons he puts on one heck of a show so we are so so excited for that uh, and just working with some of the other groups in town like Maz Entertainment he's promised to put on some pretty fantastic lights and sound and everything so it's going to feel more like a concert than anything. And last and not least, where all can people be able to access tickets and find out some more information about this online? Great question. So the best spot is to head over to our Facebook page, Border City Rotary Club Lloyd Minster. We also have an event page. It's all tied together and there's a link. Get tickets. You can click there. It'll shoot you over to Eventbrite. Everything is online this year. Just to keep it simple, just in case, you know, that slight, slight chance that we have to maybe postpone it just makes it so much easier for ticket tracking. Perfect. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today, Carla. And for everybody watching out there, this event will be coming up on March 12th. So make sure you get your tickets for Irish Pub Night. Thank you for having me, Shelby. Now, ending off with taking another quick look at your 7 day forecast here. We will be seeing that minus 11 tomorrow on Thursday with a mix of some sun and clouds. So we will be warming up throughout the rest of this week. So don't worry, maybe spring will be here soon, but I'm not, not too fast because we will be getting some more flurries next week. Friday, we'll be seeing a little bit more sun with minus six, seeing minus five for our Saturday. So we will be seeing a nice warmer weekend that is coming up here. Sunday, we'll be ending off with minus eight with a little minus 14 there on the weekend. And Monday, we'll be seeing that single digit, uh, those single digit temperatures continue on with minus six next Monday, and then seeing a 60% chance of some flurries for next Tuesday, continuing into next Wednesday at minus four on both those days. All right, thank you for that, Shelby, and thank you for joining us on this Kindness Wednesday. Our second hour continues next.